Okay, so uh, we're just waiting on people to join in there. So you're all very welcome. Thanks a million for coming along. We'll just um, we'll kick off in a couple of minutes. Um, once everybody is in, I think everybody in the lobby is probably in. Um, so yeah, uh, you're very welcome, everyone. Hope you're doing well uh, wherever you are today. It's um, it's stopped raining here. It had been raining earlier on this morning, but otherwise I think we're feeling pretty chipper about the weather in general and the fact that we've finally had a bit of bit of dry weather to get started. We'll talk a lot more about that with Richard in a second, but um, just fantastic uh, time of the year this. I'm, I'm actually in in the glass house here. I'll just actually show you the, um, the view around me here. So there's loads of beautiful seedlings and Everything is looking very, very lush. And you can see behind me there, hopefully, the bench with loads of amazing seedlings that Richard and Tim have been sowing. Um, so it's such a brilliant, this is such a brilliant time of the year. I think my favorite time of the year, actually. Uh, how would you feel about that, Richard? Would it be your fa favorite time of the year, too? Very much so, yeah. Um, the last uh, Two weeks, 10 days has saved Irish agriculture. Uh, it was pretty bleak up to that point. Every, uh, our land was flooded both here and, and the new estate. And uh, the dry weather has enabled to, us to almost catch up. Um, so let's hope we have a little bit more of it. Uh, and then we can uh, really get up to speed for the year. Do you think it was that serious that like the entire growing year was under under threat because of the because of the wet? Very much so. Um, uh, I think everything will be a bit later, but certainly for arable farmers, a lot of cereals weren't sown. Um, and I, I've seen just anecdotally quite a few of them are putting in forage maize now rather than uh, grain. Uh, so there will be an impact on Irish agriculture. But in terms of horticulture, we have a bit of flexibility. You can replace one crop with another, put stuff in a little bit later grill later um and you can catch up a little bit so yeah let's hope we get some more dry weather and we can actually uh, catch up it's funny like that um as as usual i think sometimes these these uh these issues sort of break into the mainstream media and, and they did about uh, three weeks ago i think probably it's usually when the ifa are kind of starting to to scream about it a bit uh like they they were starting to talk in mainstream media about uh the potato crop was under threat that we there might be shortages of potatoes later in the year and so on but it was it wasn't like i i think the vast majority of people were pretty much um unaware that this was going on and that it was yeah, i think so yeah it's, it's the disconnect between people producing food and people eating it which I suppose GIY exists partly to to close that gap and close mm. that disconnect. Uh, so, yeah, um, people like myself who grow food, I've had it tough, but we'll keep going. And you'll see every tractor in the country on the move at the moment. Everybody yeah. trying to, including our own at Curramore, is trying to catch up. Yeah, I've noticed that actually. A lot of lot of tractors out on the out in the roads. Uh, yeah, someone says in the chat there, poor, poor farmers were pulling their hair out. Absolutely. Um, so I suppose uh, appropriately enough, um, we're talking about polytunnels today specifically, uh, which is all about creating a bit of shelter from, from the weather uh, in various different guises. So we'll come to that in a second. We've got uh, some questions definitely that people have sent in in advance. Thanks a million for doing that. And please do pop a uh, if you have a question pop it into the chat as well um we'll get we'll hopefully get to as many of them as we can today um so a uh, bit want to do before we start maybe a bit of a shout out that we've got loads of courses happening uh in in the real world here in grow hq um we had a, a, a fish master class on last night with jb we had 30 people on that which was brilliant Myself and Richard have been running courses as well over the last while, and and I know there's a few people on the on the webinar today who who were asked um, our weekend, our beginners weekend, which was a couple of couple of weekends ago, that they spent some time with me and Richard in the garden, and um, uh, delighted to have some of you guys here today as well uh, on the webinar. And I just want to do a specific shout out. We've a course. Uh, which is a kind of a blended, it's it's a mix, uh, it's a live coached course. Um, 
uh, with some online learning modules around food growing for beginners, uh, which is kicking off on the 2nd of May, which is next Thursday. And it's almost full. We've got two, two places left on it. It's a 12 week course. Um, and we'll, um, I'm just going to put uh, a link to that in the, in the chat here uh, in a second and also a discount code. If anyone wants to sign up, there's a 20% discount available because we want to close out those two last places. So if you've, if you're just starting out on your growing journey and interested in learning more, uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant course. We do it once a year. Uh, and we had an amazing experience with it last last year, about about 25 people on it. <clears throat> so a lovely, a lovely group of people coming together to kind of share that growing journey. So um, I'll share details of that in a second. Uh, but for now, we're going to talk about. Well, I'm just going to mention my course, actually, Mick. Um, oh, go for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah the uh, May the 26th, uh, we have a summer vegetable garden course, which is managing your garden through the summer. Um, watering, feeding, pruning, pest and disease control. And uh, uh, one thing that your course doesn't have, Mick, is the excellent lunch that uh, we have uh, for the on-site courses. So yeah, my I, my course includes a lunch, hmm. which uh, Mick doesn't. So there we go. Yeah, I thought you were going to have a go. I, I thought you were going to say one thing your course doesn't have is a really expert grower. But uh, so thank you for not not doing that. What did I say? Um, then? But, but yes, you're right. And actually, there is a I have, a, I have a course as well coming up in mid-May here in Grow HQ, which does have a delicious lunch, which is in Keeping Hens. So if you're interested in in that topic, um, you'd be very welcome to come along to that. But anyway, let's get into this. So polytunnels, Richard, first of all, why are they important? I suppose the weather, the weather over the last, well, uh, well, three, four months in particular has really highlighted how important they can be. But what's your sense of, of why they're needed? Well, it's, it's to get you out of the weather. I mean, uh... I, uh, before I came to GIY, I was running my own um, horticultural business and I actually came indoors. Uh, I'd had the two wet years of 2011-2012 and I uh, made a decision to do nothing but tunnel growing uh, as a commercial grower. And what it does uh, is, I'm sure very busy people are here listening who um uh, can't go out on whatever nice days you have. If you have a tunnel, you want to do a bit of gardening on a Saturday morning, you can do it any time of uh, yeah. the year. Uh, so uh, it also, I would say a tunnel takes you to the northern Mediterranean. So if you want to go to um, uh, Barcelona uh, on a Saturday morning and save the um, air miles, then uh, have a tunnel and uh, your, your your garden in the tunnel will be about where it would be in the northern Mediterranean now. So basically, get you out of the weather, enable you to grow um, a lot more stuff uh, in a lot longer season and um, be able to go out and work whenever you feel like it. Yeah, and actually, it's it's interesting you say that. The other, the other evening, I was doing a bit of uh, hoeing in my own polytunnel at home and it started to rain and it was it was kind of, you know, the rain was it wasn't heavy rain, but it was kind of uh, you could hear the noise of it on the ton on the plastic. And it's kind of it's just like it's a it's a lovely feeling to be sort of working away when the when the weather is kind of a little bit inclement like that and you wouldn't be outside, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Particularly if your living depends on it. Um, so, yeah, well, but uh, this year, I mean, our tunnels are up where they should be in terms of the time of year. The weather's been irrelevant to them outside. It's it's another story, though, as I said earlier, we're catching up. So if you can afford it, uh, get yourself a tunnel uh, for your for your home production. Yeah. And Richard, I suppose it's important to say, you know, for for someone who's just new to this topic, that a greenhouse and a polytunnel, you know, do effectively the same thing. Like it's all about providing cover and, and doing your it growing. Is. A glass house is a much nicer environment and a glass house maybe takes you to Alicante, uh, a tunnel takes you to Barcelona. Glass is, a, which I won't go into the reasons now, a little bit warmer and a slightly healthier atmosphere, less humid. So it's easier to grow things, but glass is incredibly um, expensive uh, compared to polytunnels. So um, if you can afford it, great. Uh, but I think realistically, most people here will be looking at a polytunnel. But um, head gardeners have always needed the Lord of the Manor to get them a nice glass house. And you can see my Lord of the Manor in uh, my glass house there now. So uh, 
Um, I, I have my own glass house to work in, um, which I will occasionally let uh, make into. Mick, you seem to have frozen. Have I frozen or have you frozen, Mick? Right, Mick seems to have got lost there, so um, I will start talking a little bit about managing the tunnel. Um, I had one question, which was, was it better to have a concrete floor to a tunnel or soil? Um, soil is always the best bet in that uh, easier to manage crops and you can uh, grow a range of different things from uh, tomatoes to salads in the winter. But critically, uh, you can grow a lot longer without watering. Um, so. Uh, natural soil is the best bet, though if you are in a city site and you have to have no choice but to put onto uh, your tunnel onto concrete, you can do that. But what you need to do is create as deep a bed as you possibly can. Things like grow bags need watering daily, uh, but uh, with my uh, tunnel production in the summer, I water once a week and um, much easier to manage and plants tend to be healthier than if you grow in them in peat compost. If you grow in them in peat compost in a container, you need to replace the compost yearly, ideally, because it, it loses its um, nature, I suppose, in my experience. Uh, but soil gets better every year when you're adding compost to it. Now, um, if somebody can put the questions up for me that were asked, because we do seem to have lost Mick there, Catherine or Susanna, uh, if you can put the questions up, uh, then uh, I can go through answering them. Richard, I'm back. Sorry about that. It, you're back. So uh, Mick uh, is back and he has access to the questions. So I just answered the question we had on soil or concrete uh, yeah. as a base for the tunnel. So uh, maybe we can go through some more questions then, Mick. Yes, listen, sorry about that. And, and um uh, I was I was kind of wondering what Divelman should be up to while I was away. So I hope you were you were behaving yourself there. With totally professional, you know me. <laughs> okay, so um, I I kind of I all I got was the end of your your uh, before I got thrown out of the meeting for some reason. Uh, you were saying about the glass house brings you to Alicante, the polytunnel brings you to uh, somewhere else in Spain. Barcelona, um, yeah. So, so, but basically, like when it comes to putting, uh, deciding where to, where, whether which of those two to get, like effectively, it comes down to cost, I guess, and the budget that you have. Yes, because you get a lot more plastic for your for your book, effectively. Yeah, we. Um, I don't know where they were this today, but uh, there were a couple on uh, my polytunnel course, and uh, he was a builder uh, and uh, he'd built a fabulous uh, glass house himself. So um, if you've got those sort of skills, you can get old uh, glass and make your own up. But way beyond my skill ability as a, um, a gardener anyway, my carpentry would be nowhere near then. But yeah, polytunnel is relatively straightforward. So let's go through yeah. the questions, shall we, Mike? Yeah. OK, so, um, well, the, the first one I would I would have is maybe thinking about where to position a polytunnel, first of all, Richard, when if, if you've got free reign. Um, I've heard conflicting things about whether they should be kind of um, positioned north, south or east, west. What, what's the... Well, the first first thing to consider is uh, they need as full sun as possible and you want to be growing things through the winter. So it's a very good idea to know where shade reaches uh, on Christmas Day, you know, and the, the winter solstice. Um, uh, because uh, if you don't have um, full sun for that period, then uh, things like salads you're going through the winter will be killed off. So have them uh, in full sun if at all possible. Um, and um, if it's a tall, windy spot, I think uh, putting the uh, tunnel uh, so that um, it's not uh, the southwesterly wind doesn't hit the gable end is quite important because the gable end is very susceptible on our windy island to getting blown in. Yeah. 
but you can have them north, south or east, west. The argument about having them uh, north, south is that the sun goes over the top in the day. So yeah. a tall, uh, a tall crop doesn't shade a neighbouring uh, short crop. So on balance, that's possibly the best way to have it. So your uh, tomatoes don't shade you know, courgettes or melons uh, on the north side of them. Uh, but um, if at all possible, make sure the gable end isn't pointing southwest. Yeah, I've 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 bought two tunnels in my life, Richard. One one kind of relatively small one, and then a a, a slightly bigger one uh, more recently. And uh, I put up the first tunnel myself, so I just bought it and and directed it myself. And then the second one was professionally sort of installed. And the difference between the two is just it's it's like chalk and cheese um my one it's it's kind of even though i tried to follow all the rules around um you know you you do it on a kind of on a on a relatively sunny day i think so that the plastic is nice and pliable um and and you want to get it you know back in at the time i dug a trench on each side and got the plastic deep into the trench and then f filled it in with soil so that the plastic's nice and tight uh, but then when the one that's professionally installed, it's actually uh, it isn't dug into the soil, the plastic at all. It's on it's attached to sort of rails on the bottom and it's so much more <laughs> tighter. It's like it's like a well, barrel. You're getting a bit the mixed up there, Mick. Um, I think I uh, like um, most wouldn't be like garden people. It's OK, I'm here to help. Um, most back garden people uh, would have probably now put the. Uh, plastic into a, a rail on the side you have two choices you said then either bury the plastic or put it into uh, either a clip or a batten on the side yeah. um most people in gardens now uh go for the uh clipped in for, uh, or battens um because you can then mow or strim up to the edge as long as you don't have the plastic too low at the edge to keep it tidy in a garden and for tightening, you can affix it relatively loosely and then tap it down uh, to get it tighter and tighter. Um, we've just put a, a small propagating tunnel up on our new site. It went up on a relatively cool, slightly breezy day. And that's all we had really in March. And uh, we will tighten it by just gently tapping along the, um, the rail to tighten it up. So I think... Um, I think it's very common now for back garden people to get the uh, the rails. It's not, I mean, I wouldn't be um, a great carpenter or handyman and that sort of thing, but a, a tunnel would, wouldn't hold any fears to me. Um, and I would probably go uh, for the rail now, although it's a bit more expensive initially and requires you to concrete the downpipes into the ground. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it makes changing the plastic very straightforward and uh, gives a neater finish and tighter plastic, which means it's less likely to get damaged in a gale. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, so, yeah, and then the other the other point you mentioned about the gable end being vulnerable to storms and things particularly, and uh, the, door, the doors are interesting. So on the doors here in, in Grow HQ, on the commercial tunnels, we've got sliding doors, which is great. On on my tunnel at home, I've got the same uh, commercial tunnel, but I had I had swing doors on it, and and what you know, as as you would expect, uh, first time I left the door open in a gale, the the door blew off, and uh, that cost a lot of you know the doors are worth five six hundred euros, I think, on those big tunnels. Yeah, I've recently replaced that with a zip a zip. Um, uh, like a zip up door basically which is not ideal but at least it's relatively cheap so i think i think those sliding doors are probably the most if you can yeah, afford but, them yeah yeah sliding doors are much I and mean, we do live in a very windy island which is getting windier with uh climate uh, crisis uh if you can afford sliding doors yeah i um uh, the ones i put up my commercial tunnels at home uh to keep it cheap i put in um well, partly homemade doors actually but uh, uh swinging doors and even uh, hammering stakes in the ground are found in the worst gales they will start swinging around you know they were swinging yeah. uh, spontaneously so yeah if you can afford them with tunnels you get what you pay for a little bit 
And certainly if you're on an exposed site, go with one of the quality manufacturers and you pay a bit more. Don't go online and get the cheapest uh, if you're in any sort of exposed site because the tunnel will often move itself into your neighbor's garden or field if uh, yeah. in, in a bad gale, you know. So Richard, a few practical points then, like I know it's a bit how long is a piece of string, but how much could, how much should a, a back garden grower be be looking to pay for a decent sized tunnel? Like obviously it depends how big you go and so on, but like we, we have a kind of um, a training tunnel here, which the, the GIY uh, Waterford group use. Um, that's, you know, probably your typical back, size, back uh, garden size polytunnel. What kind of money would you be expecting to pay around like 700 to a thousand euros something like that uh i would pay more um in that um there's two um aspects to getting a larger tunnel the larger the tunnel uh the uh, more heat you're retaining in it uh so you get much better growth in the spring because there's a bigger volume of air which is keeping the heat overnight and the other thing is the larger the tunnel is the cheaper it is per square meter um but obviously people get get what they uh you know they can afford um yeah i don't think you're going to get much that's very usable <laughs> sorry uh for under a thousand um and if you can spend <coughs> two or three so much the better in that when you're arranging the beds in a tunnel <coughs> i i found it's much better to have a path two paths along the edge because that area is slug heaven and um, it's uh, if you have a bed, you should have it so you can reach into the middle from both sides. If you only come from one side, your beds along the edge can only be about 50 centimetres wide. <coughs> so I think by, my advice, and certainly the advice I gave on the polytunnel course, that we were at, well, courses that we ran here earlier in the year, was to have two outside beds, uh, two outside, sorry, paths of 50 centimetres and one in the middle of 50 centimetres and two beds then, growing beds of a metre, which gives you a minimum width of two and a half metres to make a, a handy tunnel. And if you mm. have one which again costs a little bit more straight sided rather than a, a semicircular hoop, uh, then it's much easier to work from the edge, even in a small tunnel. Uh, you don't get your back soaked all the time. Um, yeah. So if you can um, say we're adding the cost to people, and, um, which makes it awkward. But if you have one that's two and a half metres wide, uh, straight sides and sliding doors made by one of the better manufacturers that are quite sturdy and have, it, have the dam pipes concreted in, and the uh, plastic held with a clip along the side, then uh, then you're in business, really. Uh, yeah. Any movement away from that, <coughs> then it becomes harder to really, uh, you know, to really manage it well. But you can, um, you know, what people obviously will get what they can afford. Yeah, um, that's really good advice. And I, I've I've tried loads of different layouts for paths and, and beds in my tunnel at home over over a long period of time and i think i think you're right having those outside outside paths along the edges of the tunnel makes slug uh, control much better and um, and and we should say like we're not we're not um we don't sell polytunnels so we're not sort of we're not uh we don't have any kind of vested interest here nor are we aligned with anyone in particular but like to to recommend a couple of places if you are looking we've we've certainly bought Polytunnels here, and I have at home from Colin Warren. Polytunnels is in. Yeah, they're Mead. they're very. Colin Warren are very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Polydome are good as well, and oh, you in these sort of situations, you risk um, excluding good manufacturers. But they're the two. There was a third company that no longer do hobby tunnels as well. Um, those two I found very reliable over the years, uh, and I'm sure there are others. So it's difficult. Uh, but um, I would suggest you get one which is comparable with their pricing, uh, if you, because if you go cheaper than that, you're going to have problems in gales, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay, what so was that mentioned... manufacturer mentioned? Yeah, Colum, Warren and Polydome were the two manufacturers. Yeah, and High Bank, I suppose, but probably for more bigger commercial. The, uh, High Bank have stopped doing uh, hobby tunnels now. Okay, fair enough. 
Uh, and I think Quick Crop over over in Sligo do do smaller tunnels. Um, so there's there's lots of options out there. I suppose is the point. Um, and then yeah, somebody asked in here. Th these questions then, Richard, are sort of uh, I suppose a bit more on the practical side of being inside the tunnel. So so uh, temperature control uh, as a general point. I think it's Kirsten is asking that question. Um, and it's a really interesting point. And actually, kind of just from watching, I suppose, the way you you manage the tunnels here, I've learned a lot about how important temperature control is and, and you know, the door is being kept, you know, uh, closed uh, tight at this time of the year and open completely at later in the year. Do you want to speak a little bit about, about that and how important that is? <coughs> yeah, um, the thing is in a tunnel you're you're playing god really you control the whole environment and what you're paying for is an increase in temperature as much as anything um you control the temperature and control ventilation by opening the doors i have the benefit obviously uh of being here on site um or one of my colleagues is every day uh, though i have to come in at the weekend to make sure i'm on site to open and shut and you judge it with the weather. Now, uh, I realise that most of you won't be full-time gardeners, if any of you, and you'll have jobs to go to and so on. Um, it is better to overventilate than underventilate, because if you underventilate, you can end up with very, very high temperatures in a tunnel. Um, the last week or two I've been ventilating every, sorry, the last week I've been ventilating every day from mid-morning to mid-afternoon. Uh, but today I'm not because it's not sunny. So I suppose the best advice would be uh, check the weather forecast. And if it's going to be uh, bright sunshine for the afternoon, uh, open your tunnel doors in the morning. If it's uh, not going to be bright sunshine for the afternoon, uh, then uh, leave them shut uh, for April. And gradually as you're going into May, it's, you're going to be, leave, as it gets warmer, leaving them open more and more. And um, when I used to be a one man band here uh, in the past, um, just for my own mental health, I used to leave them open completely so I didn't have to come in and out every day uh, from uh, sometime in early June when the weather got really warm. Um, leave the doors open permanently then. Uh, so uh, you, really the only time that you regularly opening and shutting tunnels is the shoulders of the year and that's from uh, mid-April through to early mid-June and then it may be again in September. Okay, uh, the, fair enough. The rest of the year your doors are completely shut or completely open and for there's a question I saw popped up there about ventilating with side windows yeah, unless uh, <clears throat> you have a, a tunnel more than 20 meters long uh, there's in my experience no need for side ventilation at all. Yeah, OK. Uh, there was a question Rosemary asked, and I think it was a, a question that was sent in in advance by Joy as well about cleaning, cleaning tunnels. So and obviously uh, Rosemary is saying something organic and good, so she doesn't want to use any any sprays. So was that feeding? No, cleaning, cleaning the plastic. Or oh, cleaning plastic. <coughs> All you need, um, use detergent. Uh, and I found that um, uh, the uh, washing powder is better than um, uh, like very liquid or anything because uh, possibly the little bits of grit or whatever. Uh, get your get yourself an old blanket, not a sleeping bag with a zip on. Uh, tie ropes to either end, and then you have two people, and you're working your way along the tunnel on the outside, and have a, a, a bucket of. Uh, suds and you keep dunking every meter or two dunking the blanket in it and you work backwards and forwards great way to fall out with your partner um because you have to have a good rhythm going along um i claim i have a good sense of rhythm my partner doesn't but she might claim the opposite uh but uh, anyway it's, it's very quickly done <clears throat> and then you can just get a hose and wash the top off a lot of people use a pre um a power washer I um, I think it weakens the plastic, though some people disagree with me, but I, I found always very handy a couple of times a year 
uh, to to work your way along with a, a blanket with two ropes. Yeah, that's a brilliant idea. Uh, I've I've used also just a soft brush with the same, like using using a, a washing powder, um, and find that very good as long as it is a soft brush and nothing nothing that might. Yes, the plastic. and you can only go up, up the sides with a soft brush, can't you? For the top, uh, you need to use a blanket. Yeah. To go along. Yeah. Um. And yeah, that that sort of brings us to the sort of maintenance question, Richard. I, like, I, it is worth pointing out, I think, that the original polytunnel that I bought at home, which is has been there now for twenty years, and it's it's a um, couple of little tears and things in places, but it's it's still the same plastic. So I think if you look after the plastic, it can be it can uh, last a long time. And you can buy kind of polytunnel tape as well that, that allows you to sort of patch up little, little holes and nicks and things as well, can't you? Yes, uh, tunnel repair tape. Uh, you normally get it free when you buy a tunnel, but if not, tell them they, they should send you a couple of um, rolls. Uh, <clears throat> so keep your eye open for holes um, and patch them up. Um, uh, your tunnel's in a very sheltered spot, um, uh, so I think that's quite significant. I know your garden as a whole isn't. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't expect uh, my slightly more exposed site to get more than 10 years out of plastic. Okay. Um, and often the light transmission is getting very poor by then anyway. Uh, I certainly, when I was asked to uh, draw up um, a longer term budget for the garden here a year or two ago, I gave the total plastic seven years, so that's what it's, um, you know, uh, repayment uh, for. Uh, and if, um, sorry, the uh, whatever the counting term is anyway, the time is written off over. And um, if you have the plastic connected to clips or on a button, then it's very easy to, well, not very easy, to but much easier it. to replace it than, than having to dig out a trench and fill it yeah. in again. Okay. Um... And then somebody asked uh, Finian, I think, uh, asked this question around um, attracting pollinators into the tunnel. So it's a good question. Like, I mean, if the doors are open, I think like the butterflies and bees and things will will go in and out uh, happy enough. Um, I, I, I guess for things like courgettes and things, that's important. So what any tips on that? Um, no. Um... As you know, uh, Mick, um, you know, you're very much in favour, like I am, of uh, managing this garden for populations of pollinators and wild insects. Uh, so we have a, a fabulous population of bumblebees open the doors in the summer and in they come. Uh, I've never had a problem with pollination. Most crops actually don't need insect pollinating, but you're right, courgettes are one of them that do. Yeah. Um, melons would be another. And uh, no problem. So if you have a garden with plenty of uh, flowers and plenty of wild bits for the bumblebees to live in, you know, hedge, dirty hedgerow bottoms and so on. Uh, there should be no problem at all. Now, it's a huge problem in, um, you know, commercial glass houses surrounded by concrete deserts uh, and people introduce bumblebees into them. But that won't be a problem in your own garden if you're managing it uh, with pollinators in mind. Yeah. Um, and then on the issue on the, the subject of watering, Richard, so obviously you need to be near a water supply um, or have a very long hose or whatever, but you need to be able to get water to the tunnel. You said earlier on you're playing God in a, in a tunnel, so you have to provide water. Um, I know uh, like um, for a bigger tunnel, a seep hose, even for a smaller one, actually, you can buy seep hoses relatively cheaply in garden centres. Um, they do they do a very effective job, uh, I think, and particularly with large volumes of tomatoes and things, you can you can run the seep hose along the bed and then turn turn the water on for an hour or so, and it just drips away and gets you know gives a good soaking to the soil, I suppose. Would that, that be your kind of preferred approach? Although I guess for seep oh very very much, it's... Mick. Uh, you don't give me enough gardeners for me to walk up and down with a, a hose watching them. <clears throat> you know, we, I, Richard, you can't move around this place now. There's so many gardeners around the place. I don't know what you're talking about. It's like, <laughs> oh, um, well, yes, I suppose now. Uh, no, uh, it's um, it's very labour intensive to go up and down with a hose pipe, and people often water very badly anyway. Um, <clears throat> once things like tomatoes are established, uh, then 
because you just have to water around the plant maybe twice a uh, twice a week for the first two weeks, just where yeah. the plant goes in. But then um, to make sure the right amount of water goes in, I have sea posers laid up and down the rows. I just turn the water on, uh, it just connects up to an ordinary domestic tap, fairly low pressure, and uh, we run a hose down the garden. Um, I put it on for four hours uh, once a week uh, for my tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, aubergines, and uh, that's all the watering you need once a week, and away you go. Um, and a lot of uh, that is actually putting out about 30 litres of water per square metre, which is what they need in the summer. Um, uh, much easier done than trying to do it with a hose pipe or a watering can. And they're not overwatering. If you overwater, then you can wash all the nitrogen out of the soil and get very poor growth of things like tomatoes. So uh, yeah. it's very cheap. <clears throat> it sounds high tech. As you say, you can get them from a garden centre or I, I won't use the word mail order. I've been told that you can buy things on a computer now, haven't I, can't you? Um, you can uh, get yourself a bit of seed hose um, called various things, lay flat tubing, seed hose, trickle hose. Put it down and find out what the flow rate of it is. And um, then you uh, just turn it on once a week and all your watering is done. Yeah, that's nice. Um, somebody, Sinead's asking, what time of the year would you turn on the seed poles? I think you kind of alluded to this, that when you're planting seedlings, first of all, you need to water them directly, probably for a couple of weeks to, while they're getting established. And then, and then you yes. can use the seed poles after that. So it's not really about time of the year it's more about what's in the soil in the tunnel isn't it yes and you only really need to water very often in the summer i mean our tunnels here to keep chef happy we grow the summer crops <coughs> cucumbers peppers aubergines and lots of tomatoes we have a seed hose down for those <coughs> and um that will go in in about two weeks time a week or two's time um and then for the winter uh we grow salad leaves and for the salad leaves, the seed pose isn't very good because uh, you need to have the whole bed covered rather than just the row of the plants. And for that, I use very cheap. Um, you got one in the tunnel, if I can remember where they are. Uh, the simple things you get from a garden centre, the oscillating um, uh, sprinklers. Uh, don't get the circular ones because they make a circular pattern. So you have overlaps and gaps. The rectangular pattern ones go backwards and forwards. And uh, I... I'd put that on um, maybe cut two or three times in a winter for the salads over the winter. Don't overwater in the winter uh, and then switch watering systems for the, uh, the summer crops going out. Yeah. And and Richard, in, in terms of, of what to grow, I mean, similar to you, I tend to because I've got plenty of veg patch outside. But so I'm I'm tending to use the polytunnel for you know, salads, as you say, particularly in the off season, and then, you know, the the sort of the Mediterranean crops, peppers, cucumbers, um, uh, tomatoes, maybe some early courgettes and things like that. But actually, my sister, who's I've said here before, I think is the real grower in the family, was showing me a picture of her polytunnel last night. And it, it was a reminder, she does pretty much all of her growing uh, in the polytunnel and doesn't have a huge amount growing outside and so she's growing pretty much everything in in there um, and she'd loads of sprouting broccoli still and she garlic and onions overwintered and all this kind of stuff so it's really it's really whatever suits you in terms of in terms of what you want to grow in it isn't it well yes yeah, some things are more valuable in a tunnel than others um, and some things actually grow worse in a tunnel than outside uh, some things which <laughs> like our cool, damp Irish climate, uh, peas would be one. Um, uh, summer salads, uh, parsnips, uh, turnips, they all like, um, they're quite like Brussels sprouts, like our damp climate outdoors. Yeah. As, or broad beans. Uh, but just to summarise, really, a tunnel uh, is taking you to, um, say, the northern Mediterranean, so uh, it will grow the things we can't grow here in the summer. Uh, we just mentioned them there, the summer crops like tomatoes, cucumbers, etc. And we'll grow <clears throat> everything else earlier or later than outside. Yeah. So uh, I have some courgettes growing away in the tunnel. They're starting to flower now. 
they were producing courgettes in May. The outdoor crop, I don't usually transplant until mid-May when the danger of the frost has gone, uh, or even later than that. Um, uh, broad beans, you can have a really early crop if that's what you like, or peas yeah. you can, uh, but you couldn't grow them in the middle of the summer. It'd be too warm in there. Yeah. So um, potatoes, uh, when I used to be growing commercially, I used to have potatoes for the markets at the end of April. Uh, you work off your Christmas pudding, planting potatoes last week of December, early potatoes, and you can have them out end of April, uh, the first little hen's egg, uh, beautiful little potatoes. Um, so it will grow things out of season uh, and it will grow things that won't grow in the Irish climate, but it isn't great uh, for the real bulk stuff we want in the middle of summer. I wouldn't grow main crop potatoes in there or uh, yeah. sweet turnips or Bristol sprouts and so on. Um, yeah. All right. Um, that's all good advice. And I, actually, uh, one of the great joys of working uh, in Grow HQ is sometimes when Tim and Richard have excess seedlings, I, I get to take them home. And about, I, I'd say about a month ago or three weeks ago, I got some broccoli uh, seedlings and I put half of them in the ground outside and half of them in the tunnel and um there's an amazing like the difference between the two is just extraordinary like the, the the broccoli outside is really miserable looking hasn't grown a huge amount and the ones in the tunnel like lovely lush green uh, yeah, that's what you pay you for know, mm. about a foot tall already like so yeah yeah um a couple of good questions there uh maybe we get to these quickly richard because we've only a few minutes left uh, the tu- uh, Kay says her tunnel is on a slope. Will the sea poles work for me? Great question. If there's enough pressure, I guess it will. Um, I would imagine it would, uh, but I've never had a tunnel on a slope like that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I would imagine it would because it's um, they uh, they get up to pressure and then they trickle out. And I would imagine... As long as it's not too uh, much of a slope, then uh, you'll get an equal equal pressure through the sea pose. But uh, okay, I'm 100 sure on that. I should imagine you're okay. Yeah, all depends on the pressure. I think Jackie asks about grapes. Can you grow them in a tunnel? Absolutely. I have I have a grapevine in mine, and we obviously have the you can see the the, the uh, grapes behind me here in the glass house. Um, uh, yeah, if you're putting uh, and- a grapevine in. Uh, put it on the north side of the tunnel uh, yeah. so it doesn't shade the rest of the tunnel out. And then you get a, a sort of free crop of grapes, really. It doesn't take anything for the rest of the tunnel, <coughs> particularly you have the roots outside. It's a great idea, if you can, to put the roots outside and grow the uh, grapevine into the tunnel. Uh, and yeah. then it gets, because uh, they need a huge amount of water uh, in the spring, less in the summer, and um, let the rain do that for you outside. OK, um, and uh, surely then maybe this would be our final question. I think it's one minute to two uh, asks about putting straw over plants to keep weeds down in the tunnel. Does this work? And and actually similar question, Richard, in, in terms of paths, like I know the, the, the paths in the tunnels here in Grow HQ have got you've got gravel down. But if you didn't want to do well, that, they're the outside is, paths. Yeah. Yeah, but is um, is straw or or bark mulch a good plan for for paths? Do you think? I personally wouldn't, because um, if you manage it right, your paths are part of the growing area. The roots grow through, <coughs> and I like to break the paths up every year. Um, so I just leave them uh, hard packed and don't water them really, uh, and then break them up in in the autumn. Um, and then uh, if you have straw or bark mulch, you've got a very high carbon, low nitrogen thing that would end up getting incorporated in the soil. And that would lead to nutrient imbalances a little bit. OK, good advice. All right, listen, we're going to leave it there, guys. It's, it's uh, bang on two o'clock. So thanks a million for all those amazing questions. Hope you enjoyed today's session. We'll be back at the, the last Friday. Uh, of May. Uh, don't forget to check out uh, the GOI website. Loads of resources um, uh, free and otherwise available on the site. So please check that out, GOI.ie. Thanks a million to Suzanne and uh, Catherine for all their work in, in getting so many people. And uh, thank you, Kate, for joining us from Colorado. Lovely to have you. 
and um, lovely to see so many people on the on the, the session today. So have a great month. Enjoy, enjoy Thanks, May. So see you all again soon. Bye bye.